What's up, Ukraine? Coming to you from Brooklyn in the house, so you better believe it. Um, I'm thrilled to be with you. I first visited Ukraine in 1992 and 93. So um, I was very much looking forward to coming back and seeing all of you. And now I'm going to see you virtually, kind of, sort of. So um, I'm going to talk about my art practice. I'm going to talk about some of the organizations I run. I'm going to show you two videos. We'll have simultaneous translation. And then I'm going to be open for questions. Uh, so that's kind of it. So we can just begin the um, presentation. And a great shout out to Zero One and to the US Embassy in Kiev. So next. All right, so I have three areas of practice. Um, I made Noor, which is an emotionally intelligent, uh, no, I'm sorry, Noor, which is a brainwave opera, I'm getting ahead of myself, in, in a 360 degree theater. And a Abo, which is artificial intelligent brainwave opera, which just premiered two months ago in Estonia. Noor had premiered in Hong Kong. Um, I'm also director of ThoughtWorks Arts in New York City, which I will talk about. Um, I have a very wide international scope. I received my doctorate at the School of Creative Digital Media at Hong Kong City University. And my doctorate, which was on um, brains and surveillance, was awarded highest global honors, which means in the world, by Leonardo Labs Abstracts. So besides being um, an artist, I'm also a researcher. And I try and combine the two into creative practice. So let's go to the next one. So the first piece I did really looked at the issue of surveillance. And when I say surveillance, I don't mean surveillance of your phone. Um, I mean biometric surveillance. And it's very interesting now during this pandemic that we're actually going to start having very important, very necessary, but very strong um, biometric surveillance. At the point I was doing my research, which I started doing between 2013 and 14, um, I was reading a lot of scientific papers about the great race to decode human consciousness. And I saw that companies like Facebook were getting quite involved, Elon Musk, and many others. And in fact, many world bodies, including the United States, the European Union, Australia, Japan, Israel, China, and others, were all racing to decode human consciousness and human emotions through many different surveillance techniques. So because of that, I created an interactive, immersive brainwave opera in a 360 degree theater called Noor. Um, and it asked, is there a place in human consciousness where surveillance cannot go? The story is very simple. It's the true story of Noor Inayat Khan whose father brought Sufism to the West. And Noor worked during World War II as a covert wireless operator in um, Vichy, France, um, which was under occupation by um, the Nazis. And she sent secret messages by stringing copper wires and Morse code to the allies. She was captured three times by the Gestapo. She escaped three times. And she was eventually um, murdered at Dachau. 
and I found it very interesting that a Muslim Sufi was doing this kind of work behind enemy lines. I thought that was fascinating. I had not known about it. So I created the opera about it, and I'm going to show you a short excerpt from it. Um, there will, you'll see visuals, which are all launched by the performer's brainwaves. You'll hear sounds, which are launched by the performer's brainwaves. You'll hear a libretto, which is launched by the brainwaves. And I speak with the performer as we um, narrate the story, the true story. Uh, the four emotions are excitement, meditation, interest, and frustration. So we can talk more about it afterwards, but I just wanted to give you the sense of it. So could we go to the next slide, which is uh, the excerpt? Oh, I'm sorry, it isn't the excerpt. It's a quick, uh, it's a quick teaser of what it's going to look like. Okay, actually, um, everything you're seeing, all the visuals come from the performer's brainwaves and the pink dots that you see in the in the upper um, left hand corner are the emotion of um, excitement that she's experiencing and as you can see she interacted with the audience quite extensively which changed her brain waves which changed what the audience saw so it created a feed a lifetime feedback loop also Okay, I think the next slide is the actual opera. Whoa, I'm wrong again. Okay, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Um, so forgive me for that. Uh, uh, here is a little explanation then of how it works. Uh, data is taken from the brain. It's pre-processed, which means uh, the emotional EEG. The features are taken out and sent into algorithms from the brainwave headset. And these are numeric values. The numeric values can actually be translated into either light, color, video, animation, sound, music, and with more sophisticated sensors, vibrations, heat, smells, it, it's amazing. And it can all be driven by the brain. So the brain is the human driver in all of this. Okay, next slide. This was done in a 360 degree theater. And uh, there aren't many of these in the world. And they were created by Dr. Jeffrey Shaw, who's originally from Australia. And I was able to use his theater, which we had in Hong Kong. So you can see that the environment was completely immersive and surround sound. Uh, next slide. And here you can see uh, an example of the performer who's uh, sitting down, um, you can see her. And at the same time, the audience is free to walk around and free to uh, look at all the images, hear all the sounds, and the performer walks among them, which you'll see in a minute. Uh, next slide. Okay, now here we go. sound there is no sound no sound uh, now it's coming a little louder your Inayat Khan daughter of Hazrat Inayat Khan, who brought Sufism to the West. 
A man with a strong message. Family moved to France. World War II broke out. world I knew changed ultimately. It was war. We were looking for a new home. But Noor was not content doing nothing when she joined British secret intelligence training as a wireless operator. It was a big responsibility, required, no sacrifice. I had to learn everything one by one. Okay, uh, please keep that slide on, but all right, go back to it if you can. Yeah, so um, the thing about this is it was a first, and what I realized uh, after I did it was that artificial intelligence was coming very quickly. So please go to the next slide, but don't start it. Okay, so what I, I worked on, I've worked on in the past three years um, is ABO, uh, in which the performer still wears a brain computer headset, but it um, lights up a bodysuit of light on her body, which reflect her four emotions. And she speaks a libretto, which goes into the, uh, the computing cloud, and there's a second character, which is in the computing cloud. Abo is the character. And they talk about their relationship. And Abo responds live time from a AI I built with two programmers from scratch. It took us about 10 months to build it. And ABO is a sicko or perverted AI. In other words, it's a very special AI. It's, it's not your user-friendly AI. And I seeded it with very specific texts like Dracula and Frankenstein and Night of the Zombies and this kind of thing. Um, Abo's emotions are analyzed for their value when Abo responds, like Ava might go, I love you, and uh, Abo might say, that's nice, and then the, that's nice is analyzed for its emotions, and Abo has colors for Abo's emotions. Green is positive, red is negative, and yellow is neutral. Except Abo doesn't have emotions. And these are synthetic emotions of a synthetic being. And then Abo tries to imitate Ava's emotions, but can't quite do it because AIs can't imitate emotions. So this opera asks two questions. Can an AI be fascist? And can an AI have epigenetic or um, inherited traumatic memory? And that's what Ava is trying to imitate in Ava. So um, this just premiered two months ago. So now let's watch this clip. Okay, you can start it. sound. We have no sound. Stop. 
No sound. Can we start it again? The sound, is that possible? All sound comes from the brain waves of the performer and I, we need sound. Louder, please. most important thing in life is sleep and dreams. And AI will light up in different colors because we're analyzing the emotions of the AI response. So we're analyzing the synthetic emotions of the synthetic AI. You will also see the AI here try to take the images of the performer's memory, which you will see, and try to make them work, but they're not. I can hardly think of anything. I am so distressed. I can't stand that if you like to think I will drink her.
Okay, so I think the sound was a little rough on that one, but um, basically, uh, it was a performance that had the AI answer the performer lifetime. The AI was in the Google Cloud, and all the AI's answers were lifetime from the created AI. So uh, that's a point I wanted to make. Um, so if I can build a sicko AI and I'm an artist, uh, what does that mean about people who are really good at building AIs? And I'll just leave that as an open question. So we can go to the next screen. Next slide. And here's a little bit of how I did it. Uh, as you can see the, uh, on the right, there is uh, the, the yellow is the bodysuit of light on the performer. The performer has a sort of brown circle for a head. Uh, their brain waves go up and trigger data banks of video and sound. The person speaks, which is in blue, text, and that appears as text, and the text goes to a chatbot, which is, or, or the AI, ABO, which is um, pink, and that goes up to the cloud for analysis, and that triggers, you know, the colors you saw, sort of like the red background or the green background. Um, next slide. And there's uh, Ava uh, speaking, you know, um, talking and triggering data banks with EEG and same things. Next slide. And here's what goes on in the background where the speech, as you can see, first it's kind of yellow, then it gets dark tan, and it goes into the database, which is green, and it returns an answer in text. It, you can see the bottom arrow, which is kind of tan, but at the same time in brown, the analysis of the um, AI is not analyzed for emotional sentiment, positive, negative, and neutral, which is sort of like talking to Siri or Alexa or any of these kinds of um, home assistants. And that creates um, the visuals that it was trying to make. So it's asking a lot of questions about artificial intelligence, emotional analysis, and this kind of thing in a performance. And it's using pretty new state-of-the-art technologies. The GPT-2 database is just a year old. It's only been around for one year. So these are brand new technologies. OK, uh, next. Now, switching out of that kind of realm, <laughs> um, I'm also director of ThoughtWorks Arts Residency uh, with my co-director, Andy McWilliams, who's a full-time ThoughtWorks developer. Next. And ThoughtWorks is a software consultancy which is best known for developing what's called the Agile Method of Consulting. And, um, they have 7,000 employees in 14 countries with 43 offices. They've been around for 25 years. And they also have a very large social justice mandate. And they include ThoughtWorks Arts Residency, which is a global innovation and research lab under that mandate. Next slide. Now, under ThoughtWorks Arts, we give $10,000 to an artist or artists for 16 weeks and use ThoughtWorks developers around the world to um, help them. I use ThoughtWorks developers to make my uh, AI with GPT-2. We run shorter um, events called Artahack, which is usually over a month intensively where we bring teams together to make something new and we offer a free hardware hack lab 
every Wednesday in New York, except now we've turned it virtual, where we let anyone in the community come in and get their hands on very expensive equipment like HoloLens or Oculus Rift for free. Um, we don't teach them. It's sort of like a, a, a group that teaches itself, but we offer the space and we feed them dinner. Next. So the question is, why artists? And um, here you're looking at Neil Harbison, who is a real cyborg, which means he implants technology into his body. And he wears an antenna because he was born only seeing black, white, and gray. And the antenna looks at color and translates it to sound through a computer chip, which is in his head. And he has a cut in the back of his skull for an internet connection. And we are here with him making a new test sense, which is going to be implanted we don't implant, we have nothing to do with it, in which he will feel temperature around his skull to tell him what time it is. So we're making some prototypes here. And the reason for this is because artists are often the first to explore, understand, and articulate technologies, societal implications just like I did in my two operas. Um, it's difficult for many people to understand at first, but it's pretty avant-garde and it paves the way for new breakthroughs. Next, next slide. So when we get residents, um, we do a global call and we usually do it 14 to 16 weeks with very intense technology support. And they meet with both myself and my co-director every week. And oftentimes the artists stay with us unfunded for a year or two more. Um, we encourage that for our artists because they're working with such interesting ideas. Uh, next slide. So in terms of the Cyborg Foundation, we also um, get a lot of press, or the artists get a lot of press. Uh, and they were featured in National Geographic, The New York Times, The Guardian, uh, Business Times, for the kind of breakthroughs that they do, of which we um, support them. but that's their creative work. We don't own it, they own it. Uh, next. One artist we worked with was Heather Dewey Hagboard. And Heather works with illegal harvesting and misinterpretation of genetic data. So Heather, gather, Heather gathers genetic data from chewing gum or cigarettes. And here in Brooklyn, we have a artist space called GenSpace, which is a biological lab for artists. And Heather uh, found the DNA of people and printed 3D masks of what they could look like. So she began working with the then political prisoner, um, Chelsea Manning, and created uh, masks of what Chelsea could look like with a hundred different interpretations of what she may look like. And you can see it in the center in the Guardian article. You can, you can see the mass. And what we did is we created a comic book about it because it, we wanted people to understand what genetic analysis is and how it can be misinterpreted. Um, what happened is Chelsea was able to come to the show of um, the 100 Mask, which is a show in Soho. So that was very interesting for us. Um, and that uh, gave us worldwide attention for the work that we did with Heather and with Chelsea in terms of creating the masks. Uh, 
Next slide. Another artist we work with is Karen Palmer, who is British Columbia, uh, British Caribbean, I'm sorry. And Karen has an interactive installation, Riot, which you can see in the lower right-hand corner. And that um, analyzes your facial response as you're watching a Riot live time. And it, um, changes according to your emotions of watching this. So as you're watching the film, the film is watching you and changing, depending on your emotions about watching a riot. Uh, next. Another artist we worked, two artists we worked with, one of them uh, in with robotics, one of them was Adrian Wurzel, who started the new media program at City University in New York. And we worked with Reach Robotics um, and Mechamon, who works with Apple. And Adrian was able to create a movie um, with the robot. And we also worked with Katie Kwan, who worked with a 15 foot tall robot and uh, is a former ballerina uh, with the Met Opera Ballet. Um, next. We believe in public engagement with what we do with ThoughtWorks Arts. We don't just believe in, you know, keeping it to ourselves. So next. So we do produce videos and you can see in the upper right, Katie with the Mechamon, I mean, with the uh, large robot. Um, the Cyborg Foundation, um, and these are very well circulated uh, through all channels of social media. Uh, next. We have exhibitions such as, oops, go back one, go back one, uh, as Spring Break Show, which was part of Armory Week, where we're, we're constantly positioning ourselves within the art world uh, to show the work that we're doing. Uh, you can see one piece with dual brains, uh, with VR, we have all sorts of technologies we're working with. Next. Um, we disseminate, we have our own newsletters, we have GitHub repositories, we publish in Medium, we get written up in publications all over the world uh, about what we're doing. So we're very active in our outreach of using arts practice um, for break, uh, breakthrough ideas. Um, next. We've also worked with AI Now, um, which is an independent uh, research institute uh, that has been funded by the MacArthur Foundation and folded into NYU. And uh, they have advised New York City on uh, city government's policy for AI and government, which was a first in the world that a city government established a policy. This was before world governments did, New York City did, and AI now helped advise them. So they helped us with Karen Palmer's residency. Uh, next. Uh, we've also worked with NYU Tandon School of Engineering, and we worked with one of their uh, part participants who worked with us um, in Artahack, creating the first Shakespeare in virtual reality. And that was at, shown at Tribeca Immersive. So that was in 2017. Um, and now Tandon was given a six million grant to create America's first publicly funded AR VR lab. And they've been expanding that in the Navy Yard in New York City's new um, tech hub in the Navy Yard. Next. Uh, we also work with Indie Spaces, Jump Into the Light, which is uh, Indie VR space. So we love working with Indie Spaces. We are not just involved in large uh, entities. In fact, we promote and highlight Indie Spaces constantly. Uh, next. 
uh, Reach Robotics, again, was with what we used with Mechamon. And we also worked with Pratt Institute's Consortium for Research in Robotics. So we, we partner with many, many organizations. We have at least 50 partners. Um, right now, for our current residency in synthetic media, we're partnering, partnering with MIT uh, Doc Lab and uh, Witness, which is a human rights organization. And we're going to begin that residency at the end of May. Uh, next. And uh, finally, in Artahack, we've had uh, over 130 alumni. We do open calls. We bring people from all different areas and form teams and collaborate together. And that's somewhat of the methodology I hope to be using here in Kiev with this new workshop. Next. Um, so we have many partners also. Sometimes we do themed content. So uh, in 218, we did uh, the accessible brain and climate consciousness. It was basically biometrics or climate change. And we did projects with those. Um, next. But sometimes we don't do themed ones. We do wide open. So we can have people, we had one artist who went to the North Pole and shot lasers into the Aurora Borealis. And that was, she actually went there and did it and we helped her develop the tech for it. Or we had a, a bass player from Juilliard who wanted to turn his bass into um, an electronic instrument from the inside of the bass. So we worked with him on that. We've looked at imbalances in tech with privilege and, you know, my favorite brainwaves. Okay, next. Uh, we have also done one at Cyberfest in St. Petersburg, Russia, and that was really a lot of fun. Um, and one of the pieces, Holo Sapiens, was picked up by Tate Modern Exchange um, right after, and we did this in only two weeks. And Tate Modern Exchange got a hold of it and brought it over to London. We didn't plan on that, but that's how it went. Uh, next. So um, also, I ran the first uh, collab in the world on cyborg art with the Cyborg Foundation at Parsons School of Design. And a collab is professionals and students working together, which Parsons is very well known for. Uh, next. And out of that collab, um, it was included in a book on art hack practices around the world, uh, the methodology behind it. So this book came out a few months ago and it's full of interesting practices from maker spaces all around the world. So the Cyborg Foundation collab that we did at Parsons is included in this. And next. So now I'm here with you in Kiev and I remember very well hanging out with the artists in their ateliers off Andreevsky Street or U. And I'm totally looking forward to um, working with the artists in Kiev in the next few weeks. And I'm really psyched to get started. And that's the presentation.